Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. And you're very welcome to Country Life here on Midlands 103. It's MJ Cleary with you until 8pm this evening. Bring you little ales from the Midlands and further afield from the worlds of food, farming and agribusiness. Now, thank you all for joining me as usual here on the programme on this Wednesday evening. It's the 4th of September 2024. And what will we say about the weather over the course of the last seven days? A changeable. I suppose we could say that for the last uh, year and a half at this stage, but uh, definitively changeable over the last few days. Even this evening, driving down, it was uh, a nice afternoon, I must say, uh, around ourselves in Borough County, Offaly, and a very heavy shower then on the way to Tullamore. And it is like that. It's uh, it's raining here. It's not raining five miles away and then go another 10 and it's been a, a heavy downpour. And that really is the story of the summer. However, some good news this weekend. North of 20 degrees promised on Friday and on Saturday. So hopefully that comes our way. We need it. There's no question about it. And we are hoping, fingers crossed, that it comes our way. But it's just so hard to tell and weather changes so quickly. There is a lot of silage still to be made. Third cut silage, second cut in some places to be made. So we could do with a a blast of two, three weeks now. Good weather in September. Just to give us a little bit of a... A breather, shall we say, in advance of the weather. So we're all hoping for that. And obviously still lots of straw to be bailed as well around the country. So this weekend uh, is needed and fingers crossed it occurs. Uh, somebody who's really looking forward to good weather this weekend and this Sunday in particular is Pat Carroll from the Clannesley Show. He's going to join me in just a moment to chat about the annual event which is taking place in County Leash on Sunday. Also this evening, David Layden from IFAC joins me to chat about their seventh food and agribusiness report where the forecast is that the agri-food sector is poised for further growth. However, 81% of companies surveyed stated that they have seen a rise in input costs in the last year and that coupled with the fact that almost half of businesses surveyed stated that they couldn't meet the salary expectations of potential new employees makes expansion all the tougher. That's a really interesting stat I thought when I was looking at this report. 46% of businesses surveyed stated that they couldn't meet the salary expectations of new employees and it does show the cost of living crisis I suppose we're in at the moment whereby things are just so expensive the employees need so much just to make ends meet that these uh, businesses these SMEs are really struggling to recruit. Hannah Quinn Mulligan is a farmer from County Limerick and you'll know her from her regular articles in the Farming Independent where she speaks about selling direct from her home farm through the family farm shop. Uh, She among other farmers are the subject of a new documentary starting this evening on TG Cahar it's on at 8.30 actually just after the programme and it's entitled Quavnori Natalun Uh, we'll hear about it from Hannah a little bit later here on the programme there are six farmers I think it was shot over 2022 and 2023 and it follows them over the course of a period of time and they're all farming in line with nature I suppose in as sustainable a manner as they possibly can and uh, it charts their journeys, what they see, what works, what doesn't work. And uh, it is going to make for interesting uh, viewing. Norman Dunn is uh, one of the farmers. Norman spoke to us here on the programme not too long ago. He's part of the BASE, the B-A-S-E group of farmers who are far- trying to farm or aiming to farm in as sustainable a manner as possible. There's also uh, a small dry stock suckler herd on Inish Moor which would be very interesting to see the challenging weather and how uh, farmers on the island deal with that. There's also a farm down in East Cork. Uh, There's another one in County Clare. And uh, as I said, Hannah Quinn Mulligan from Limerick and a Norman Dunn. Uh, He's in Maynooth. And that is taking place this evening. It's at 8.30. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Also, the Health and Safety Authority have, as of Monday of this week, launched a farm inspection campaign. So this is running for two weeks, so this week and next week. And it's focusing on safe work at height. Darren Arkins from the programme will join me later to chat about just how dangerous a fall from height can be and how renting something like a cherry picker 
could be the best decision you've ever made in your life. There was an accident from height, unfortunately, on a farm just this weekend gone. I was speaking to Darren earlier. And uh, the important thing about this is not to provoke fear into farmers. I don't want you thinking, oh my God, someone's going to come in around the corner here from the HSA and they're going to end up uh, finding this wrong and that wrong. Uh, If you get an inspection, they're unannounced. And look, it's unlikely, to be honest, because uh, it's only running for two weeks and there are so many farms all over the country. It is more so to give you some guidance and some advice. And this is the time of the year, September, October, where things are that little bit quieter in the run up to winter. And we are keeping an eye now on sheds, saying to ourselves, maybe, well, as late as possible, hopefully, but into November, uh, late October, cattle will be going in. So you might be looking at an eve run that needs to be cleaned out or a downpipe that isn't working. And these are all the things that you might tackle with a ladder. However, that mightn't be the wisest decision and Darren's going to speak to us about that a little bit later. Now, as always, text me or WhatsApp me here on 083 30 10 103. Be happy to put anything to our guests this evening. Now, as I said at the outset, one man who's looking for good weather this Sunday in particular is Pat Carroll from Clonus Lee Show. Uh, is it going to happen, Pat? What's the weather going to do on Sunday? Predict it for me, please. Well, sure, MJ... We're praying and hoping uh, that it will be fine overhead anyway. I know the weather forecast is given very good Friday. Saturday uh, looks good. Sunday, we were just praying and hoping that it might just hold off for us. Um, because last year, we had a real, real good start to the day. And in the middle of the day, it just poured down on us and destroyed our crowd. And uh, that's the last thing we want, you know. So we're just really, really hoping. Massive effort being put in uh by our committee to try and make this uh, show, especially it's the 70th year, and um, we're just trying to pull out extra stops this year to make it uh, a little bit extra special because of the 70th. Yeah, it's been on the go, as you say, I've had 70 years, and that's a phenomenal achievement in itself to have uh, have it running for, for this long. But look, back in the day, I suppose 60-odd, 70, 50 years ago, uh, when entertainment was light on the ground, these shows were the be-all and end-all of the farming community. But something I've noticed in the last couple of years, especially with the challenges we're facing in agriculture as a result of everything we have to do to keep our heads above water, but also the weather the last couple of years. We are seeing more and more interest in shows, bigger crowds. We saw the biggest crowd ever at Tullamore Show back a few weeks ago. And people are are flocking to their local shows and to these shows in order to get a bit of a breather and to just chat to a few people and have a good day out and have a have a break from it all. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I was walking in Tullamore Show this year and uh, I've seen all that and... Um, Yes, it is, uh, you know, it's more of a family event now with, you know, uh, incorporated with an agricultural show. There's a lot of side attractions that people go on. They get out and they have a bit of a chat that might be after having a bad week, that had be weather-wise or price-wise and things might be going. And they all meet up together and they have a bit of a chat and a bit of a banter and um, they kind of forget about it there for, for that day. And especially if the sun is shining overhead, the amazing way the, the agri sector uh, were very weather orientated, and if we get a little bit of fine weather, we're all buzzing again very, very quick, and we forget about these big heavy showers that we had this evening very, very quickly, you know. So, just that uh, thing that, you know, over the last couple of summers is, is playing hard on, on, on everyone because they're getting it hard to get their crops, they're getting it hard to maybe make ends meet expenses as we all know are very very high and no real sign of them dropping down that much uh, in the near future from what I can see in the agri sector. Yeah absolutely and that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit later Pat here on the programme is um, agri food businesses and feeling the hit of those increased input prices. Just uh, a few of the categories that people are drawn to at the Clannis Lee show and you have some great uh, prize money on offer. One of those is the All-Ireland Championship Best Heifer or Bullock any age or breed. Anthony Meyer there in Clannis Lee is sponsoring it and it's uh, a big price, fifteen hundred euro. You're going to get a big, big, big uh, increase of um, competitors for that one, uh, Pat. Yeah, a nice few entries have come in there. We uh, introduced that there last year, and uh, it did bring an extra sport around the uh, the cattle section. And uh, there's no saying angles. Once you put a few bob on board, it, it does attract the people in, and we have a nice few entries for that there again this year. 
and it is a very, very good uh, prize money. And we're very, very happy that Anthony Maragri did come on board uh, with us there for that because uh, it does make it uh, very, very attractive. And all cattle entries are up this year, especially the, um, the Frisian end of things, the dairy sector. We never had as many entries in Clonestee as long as some of the older members can remember. It's the biggest entry ever, ever uh, for that. Our sheep entries are all up. Poultry is up by at least 20%. So we're very, very happy to see um, entries growing there. And now, it's probably not without uh, a good bit of work by uh, a small group of people who have, who have driven this, you know. Yeah, well, all show, the horses. All show committees, uh, Pat, I have to say, and, and dealing with them here over the course of the whole summer long, all the different local ones around the Midlands, it is a small bunch of people who put in a tremendous amount of work to get these shows up and running, get them off the ground. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for the small group of people, you know, we try and designate certain sectors to certain people. You know, we have a couple of guys here looks after horses and ponies and a couple of guys looking after the cattle, the same with the sheep, the same with the poultry. Uh, but it's only, you could count them on one hand, but it's night and day now for the last uh, fortnight, three weeks, and every night this week now, we, there's something for somebody to be doing. Uh, currently now we're here just getting up uh, uh, sheep, sheep pens and stuff like that. And um, um, it's just... Shoulder to the wheel now and, and, and driving it on. Yeah, and I'll go. A couple of the big ones you are well known for as well in Clonestly Show, Pat, and that's the, uh, the Gay and All-Ireland Dog Championship. You also have All-Ireland Belgian Blue Junior Bull. Uh, the Young Handlers is a big one, again, keeping the younger people interested in, in this, and they're the future of all these shows. You have Young Handlers in Cattle and Young Handlers in the Sheep section. And one as well which does draw a, a big crowd, and it's uh, old school, but I see them coming back more and more. That's the tug of war always a good bit of crack oh absolutely it was one thing was always big here for a number of years and it faded away but we brought it back last year and uh, uh, we had a great great tug of war here last year and Kilahi was the eventual winner to be the, a team from uh, South Key Kenny and uh, it was massive entertainment now this year we have a few new local teams in with Cannonstown up the road we have Kalashi, we have Rose Alice coming and we have Rat Downey and possibly a couple of teams from Limerick. A uh, huge interest in that. And uh, that does bring an extra group of people to the event. And it's always a great thing to uh, maybe finish off your day. We try and push it out that the cattle judging and the sheep and all that judging is nearly over. So then people can get a chance to come over. Because there's always a number of people who have friends that's pulling to go war and brings a great banter between the parishes around here now. We find it really, really uh, uh, a crowd uh, catcher. Excellent, uh, Pat. Look, there's also music there, Rock on Paddy D. Morrissey, and uh, there's going to be lots on offer on the day. We'll let you go, Pat. We'll say fingers crossed for the weather on Sunday. Look, it's a great family event, great community event. You're putting a lot of work into it, so hopefully people can make the effort and pop over to you on Sunday in Clonesley. Many thanks, Pat. Thanks again, MJ, and uh, hopefully we'll have a fine day. Adults, 10 euros each, children go free, so uh, feel free to come along and uh, enjoy your day. Uh, great stuff, Pat Carroll there from Clonestly Show. As we said, that's taking place this coming Sunday. And a 10 euro for an adult and free for a child. You can't complain with that. Lots on offer on the day. Now, coming up after the break, we're going to be talking about a new campaign. Well, a campaign which is running for these two weeks. The Health and Safety Authority, the HSA, are running it. It's about working at heights on farmyards. And we have Darren Arkins from the HSA. He's going to talk all about it in just a moment. So stay tuned for that. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park, Tullamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. W. Or show.ie. And you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. Now we are moving on to working at heights on farmyards and we have Darren Arkins from the Health and Safety Authority on the line. Darren, many thanks for taking my call this evening on the programme. Uh, good evening, MJ. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, you're more than welcome, uh, Darren. So look, it's a campaign. It's working at heights on farmyards. It's uh, launched on Monday last, running for a fortnight. Uh, just a little bit of background on this, please, uh, Darren. What's behind it all? Yeah, absolutely, MJ. Um, yeah, so we're running um, a two-week campaign and we've, we do this every year. 
And we try and run our campaigns uh, prior to what we consider like peak activity times for, for certain um, uh, works on, on farms. So you, you might remember we, we ran a campaign just before last summer on tractor and machinery uh, safety uh, just before the silage uh, season kicked in. So again, this, this uh, campaign we're running over this two weeks is focused on working at heights and we're trying to get out the farms really before the farmer will consider, you know, he, they may have some maintenance or repair work to do coming up in the next month or two. So we want to get to them really before that and uh, give give advice to them and just, just bring to their attention sort of the, the, the standards that are there and what's required. But again, just to say, as a part of the campaign, the, the, the inspectors will also um, be uh, carrying out just a regular inspection as well. So our plan hopefully is to get to farms in, in, in all counties over these two weeks and uh, and just raise awareness about uh, engage with the farmers basically on on how to plan uh, safely you know when it comes to working at height if they if they if they're planning to do so. Uh, one thing, um, Darren, that uh, farmers are cognizant or wary of, I suppose, is the word is inspectors, and there are lots yeah. of them. Department of Agriculture, Board B, um, HSA, uh, etc., to name a few. And uh, when they see maybe someone coming around the corner with a clipboard, they you know put their heads down and say, "Oh my God, what's going to happen? How much is it going to cost me? <laughs> what story with this?" So to allay that, uh, I suppose, uh, Darren, and put put it to one side. Um, what would you say to farmers who are listening going, oh my God, this is the last thing I want to see now, someone coming in around the corner and telling me I have to do this, that or the other? Yeah, well, no, the, the, there's, there's nothing to be fearful about in terms of um, our inspections. And, and just the first thing to say to MJ, we, we definitely won't be ca- carrying uh, clipboards. Um, but, that's a good, uh, that's a positive. It, there. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a positive. But no, we're, we're, we're basically, um, you know, our approach generally is, uh, to be you know, as helpful as possible and give guidance and the feedback generally from our inspections is always very positive in that regard from the farming community. Um, you know, they, they tend to get a lot of benefit from, from the advice and the experience from the inspectors. And just to say, like most of the inspectors on my team, um, you know, are come from a farming background. Actually, some of them are part-time farmers. So, you know, they fully understand the challenges um, for the sector, especially this year with 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 the way the, the, the weather has gone and, 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 and these small windows of opportunity now um, that the farmers, are, you know, they're under pressure. So we're not coming in to make life more difficult, MJ. You know, we're coming in to, um, you know, we're trying to be proactive, really. And, you know, I suppose to put things in perspective, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out at the moment to individuals that um, fell from a height there last Saturday and uh, down in West Limerick. Um, which was publicised, and that's that's exactly why you know what we're trying to prevent, you know, serious injuries or, or worse, you know, in relation to to working at heights. Um, so no, it'll be it'll, it's always a you know conversational based, and uh, you know we've we've obviously got a stand coming, you know, a big stand at the ploughing as well, um, the week after next, and we'll have uh, the same inspectors will be there, and willing to take any questions and and assist. So, um, you know, I'd like to think MJ that it, it should be a positive experience. Uh, also, Darren, when it comes to working at heights, I suppose you have two potentials here. You have a farmer looking at his or her shade in advance of the uh, upcoming winter period and they might be looking at a downpipe or an eave run that needs repairing and it's the farmer may uh, aim to do that themselves. So that's that's kind of one side of it. And, you know, yep. obviously we're, we're pushing uh, that you, you would work from a mobile elevated work platform as opposed to a yep. ladder. Fairly straightforward get someone to help you, harness in, you know, if you're going to do it and, and, and work, you know, in a, in a safe uh, a manner. Now, the other side of it is for a lot of shed works or roof works or repairs, you're going to bring a contractor in. Um, also, now there is a big push on solar. There's lots of solar panels going up on yep. farm of sheds. Uh, also, so look, the farmer's not really going to have much to do with that. They're going to see the contractors going up on it. But something that you did uh, roll out earlier this year, uh, Darren, and this is something that is widespread in the construction industry, but not so widespread in the agricultural uh, industry, is an agreement whereby the farmer and whoever's going up in the shed sign a little simple contract uh, that basically yep. ag- uh, make an agreement about this. Can you just elaborate on that kind of simply for us? Yep. What's that about? Well, look, you've, you've put that very well yourself, MJ. Um, yeah, so, so basically, um, I think what's sometimes underappreciated is that you know anything but minor repairs you know are considered construction work, um, which sounds which might be difficult to understand you know if you're repairing or replacing sort of roof sections you know that's actually construction work and then um, the construction regulations apply, and what's required then 
is that the there will be a written appointment with any contractor that's coming in to carry out that work that they will become the project supervisor for that work and and in order to you know and that's that's a common uh, common transaction that goes on say in the construction sector as you said um, so what we've done is we've uh, produced a, a document in, in conjunction with our farm safety partnership and our construction safety partnership uh, called how to make your construction appointments for your farm and it's only a six seven page document and it's very easy to follow and it explains the steps required and actually provides a template that the farmer and the and the contractors can fill out and sign but like there's significant benefits um, not only if it's well not only then there's a legal requirement uh, to make those appointments um, but the benefits to the farmers that you know he is protected or she is protected you know um, under the law as long as they've made those appointments and um, but also what it does it puts the onus then on that contractor to fulfill his duty under the construction regulations as a project supervisor for the design of that work and for the, the actual implementation or the carrying out of that work and that significantly should reduce um, the possibility of a serious accident um, on, on that job. So it's a tried and trusted way of, of managing these construction projects. It might seem daunting, you know, when I say it, but if, if you go onto our website and you, and you have a look at that document, how to make your construction appointments for your firm, you'll see it's very, very straightforward, very easy to read, and there's templates there, you know, easy to fill out. And I understand the copy was sent out to uh, most of the firms there at the beginning of the year from the Department of Agriculture. So um, well, you know, I'd urge, urge people to have a look at it, even if they're not planning and working at height at the moment, just to familiarise themselves with the process and they'll realise it is straightforward, MJ. Yeah, very good. No, and farmers will be familiar with that document there. And it was, it was sent out and I'd say a lot of farmers just barely glanced at it. But when you're putting it yeah. like that and it, you know, removes, you know, liability from them and ensures that the project supervisor must uh, adhere to the correct procedures, it does make it uh, more straightforward and more appealing, really, for the farmer. That's really what we're talking about. Uh, Darren, I'm just coming to the end of the chat. But uh, look, sure. you're, you're dealing with health and safety all day, every day. It's your it's your job and you're passionate about it. It's, it's clear to, to hear here on the programme what's the one piece of advice you would give you give one piece of advice for farmers listening um, in general in relation to health and safety something maybe you see over and over and over again or something you just think that people will continue making this poor decision going forward is there anything that springs to mind look it's really it's really around planning uh, MJ you know it's just using the down times and I know there's not many down times but just to plan ahead and it makes a big difference, you know, and there's plenty, you know, there's plenty of guidance there for any of the health and safety risks on farms. There's, you know, and even through our own farm safety partnership, they've done an ocean of work, you know, in relation to producing videos and all that. But even just taking that time out to um, to, to, to have a look at some of that, if you're planning, you know, any sort of um, activity on your farm, um, just to plan ahead and, and, to, and give yourself the time. Because, you know, to give you an example, we're working at heights where things can go wrong now is that, you know, if you know there's an issue with a, with a roof on on one of the buildings on your farm and you're leaving it and you know you have to do it and then suddenly the weather turns and, and it becomes apparent it needs to be fixed. It's there 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 are times when you're going up to that roof under duress and that's when mistakes can happen. And as I would say, MJ, you know, you can replace, you know, a roof sheet, but you can't replace the person. And I think if if the one bit of advice is just, you know, take a bit of time out every now and then and just think ahead and um and, and ask for assistance, ask for advice. We have a contact centre there at the HSA and you can phone and we've colleagues there that will always point you in the right direction in terms of guidance. So, um, and uh, as I said, when the inspectors um, come, if the inspector does arrive on your farm, use it as an opportunity as well, you know, to ask um, whatever questions you need to ask and, and they'd be glad to help too. Fair play, Darren. Uh, many thanks for coming on and uh, giving us that information in uh, really manageable chunks, I have to say. And look, you are at the ploughing and people can pop in and have a chat with you. Darren Arkins yeah. from the HSA. Many thanks, Darren. Thank you, MJ. Bye now. And um, that is running for two weeks. So it's the farm inspection campaign focusing on safe work at height. And uh, we all got that uh, template, that agreement. I think it came with the single payment last year. So that would have been, what, maybe last March. And it's this template agreement. So basically, look, if you're planning on doing any work on shades or you're getting contractors into any work on shades, it is in your interest to have a look at this. Maybe ask your ag advisor uh, about it. And it's a very simple little agreement, which basically ensures that liability 
won't be on you if there's an accident on your farm. And that's really what you want because uh, you want to ensure that the contractor has the proper insurance and the proper covers uh, for him or herself and his or her employees. So that's an important one. And also the other one to take from that, as Darren said, is planning. And I was speaking to a neighbour of mine not too long ago. He's involved in gardening and does lots of uh, hedging work and cutting and whatnot all day, every day when the weather permits. And he said it's only recent that he started renting a cherry picker for certain hedging jobs and uh, he'd never go back. And it's something as simple as that. Not that expensive for tool Hire uh, depots all around the Midlands and for a couple of hundred euro you'll get something there for the bones of a day which will make your life so much easier and so much safer. And uh, look, we all take risks and we all do it. There's no point saying any different and we're all under pressure and we're all running and racing and we're all working against the clock. But um, I suppose they're calculated. You try and calculate these risks and ensure you're not putting yourself in, 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 in you know, danger that's uh, going to lead to an accident. Really, that's what it's all about because... If you get injured on the farm, then who does the work? That's really the way we all have to think. Now, coming up after the break, we're going to be talking to David Layden from IFAC, and it's about their seventh annual food and agribusiness report. And uh, these SMEs, these food businesses, are all talking about rising input costs. So it's that happening at Farmgate, and then it's happening for the food businesses also. So let's see what the report has to say about that. And we'll speak to David after the break. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. And you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. Now we are moving on to the annual food and agribusiness report from IFAC and David Layden joins us on the line. David, many thanks for joining me here this evening on the programme. Yeah, thanks MJ, good evening. Uh, full year since I was talking to you, David. It is amazing how quick time goes. It happens with these reports where I'm speaking to maybe someone from Chagas or someone from yourselves and you're involved in it and it happens annually. Uh, it's almost scary because it feels like only a few weeks ago. However, it is your seventh annual report. Uh, last year was your sixth. And a lot of detail in these. I have to say, David, you really uh, go into the nitty gritty of it. But from the outset, just one of the big um, stats is that 81% of these uh, food and food um, SMEs report rising input costs as an issue for the business. And uh, really, I suppose that's, that's the story of the last couple of years for business, isn't it, really? It very clearly is. And this has been, along with a couple of other headwinds, this has been a really consistent trend in the reports. The last couple of years, nearly 80% or 80% plus of businesses have all been experiencing an increase in costs. And sure, it's reflective of what the consumer has experienced and it's really reflective of what um, farm families have experienced as well. So SMEs aren't getting away with it. They're experiencing big cost increases. Um, it's putting pressure on margin and look at it's leading to a lot of them having to increase price as well. Yeah, and this increase in price, as you say, then is coming back to the consumer and uh, they're in lies the problem. It's kind of a vicious cycle, really. There's no escaping it in a way. Uh, but um, the, the rising cost is one thing, as you say, look, it's, it's hitting profitability. Uh, but there's also another one. And uh, again, I mentioned it at the top of the hour, and it is almost 50% of these SMEs uh, cannot meet the salary expectations of qualified candidates. So you have the inputs on one side, and then you have um, a challenge with uh, new talent as well on the other side. It makes growth like really hard. It does. It makes growth difficult. And the employment and recruitment area has been a big issue for the last couple of years. And even in this year's report, three in four businesses find it difficult to recruit the right people, right? So that's consistent in the reports. And in terms of the salary expectations, you know, there are big salaries available in other sectors. This is a great sector to work in. Sometimes the margins are quite tight. And when you're looking to build great teams, um, salary expectations do come into play and it can be a challenge. So, yeah, 46% are, are, are struggling to meet salary expectations, especially when building their international teams. Uh, for these SMEs, what kind of, if you could grab one of them and, and uh, give it a fictitious um, name or a profile, like what are we talking about kind of turnover-wise and um, staff numbers if you were given an average of uh, who takes part in the survey? Yeah, so in the methodology, you'd see there that, um, you know, 25% of the companies surveyed are under um, 10 employees, 31% have between 10 and 49 employees, and then 
another 21 percent up to 250 employees and then 250 plus employees are 11 percent. so there's a lot of figures but mm. um that's sort of the range so you're getting the full range from that small business maybe five or six people all the way up to you know a number of larger businesses so we we surveyed 124 business leaders um everything from the likes of Alco to, you know, ag tech startups like AgriData Analytics, JFC, Finnegan's Farm. There's a whole range of them there. Um, a good few based in the Midlands as well. So there's a good range um, and many of them are facing some of the same same challenges. Uh, who are you seeing is having the biggest challenge? Is it, uh, you, would, you would automatically think, but maybe I'm wrong, that it's the the smaller of the um, the SMEs, those maybe four, five, six employees, or is it in fact the larger ones that are that are finding these rise of input costs and the higher salaries and whatnot? Who who's the one that's under most pressure, or is there an answer to that? Um, it depends, right? It depends at your stage of growth. If you're very comfortable with five or six people and profitable, then you're fine. It's when you're making the jump to ten or fifteen people that it can become challenging, and the same way all along the way up, right? So as you make the jump from sort of one, sort of you're, you're comfortable at, say, 100 employees, you know, you're profitable, things are going well. But to make the next step up, you need to invest a lot in CapEx. You need to invest in new markets. You need to invest in a different type of employee. Then it gets tight again. So actually, there's small companies that are very comfortable and there's small companies under pressure and the same um, for medium and for larger organizations. I suppose one thing that we do focus on one in three companies um, are experiencing short or medium term cash flow issues. Mm. And that's really, really big red flag for us. And any company that we're working with that has a cash flow issue, you know, we have to focus on that immediately because you can lose money on your P&L for a year or two. But if you run out of cash for one hour, the business is over, you're gone. So cash flow, you know, it is concerning to see one in three businesses, you know, experiencing short or medium term cash flow issues. Yeah, it really is. Uh, the report is indicative of what's happening on the ground in farming as well, uh, David. As you know, as you're well aware, you've been involved in IFAC, but uh, cash flow is the is the issue now on farms as well, as a result of just being squeezed, you know, for the last kind of year and a half. Um, the cash flow then look if a uh, if a business needs uh, financing to to bridge the gap. What are you seeing in relation to financing and and value? Is money are companies finding it expensive to get some uh, short term finance at the moment, or how are they finding it? Yeah, financing is hard and your mix of finance, how you're financing the business for growth um, is something that we address in the report. Like, are you looking for some equity? Are you looking at crowdfunding? What are the what what are your banking options? Is it private equity? So there's a there's a couple of options there. Obviously, for those companies that are expanding and growing internationally, Enterprise Ireland is a really important um source of funds for capex development or for employing um high caliber senior staff so there is a there, there's a range of funding sources there i suppose the key thing that we'd always be talking about is do your cash flow planning do your planning think about the future think about how it looks think about how your cash flow cycle looks and um, that's pretty critical uh, the big one, uh, David, that is in all areas of agriculture, and that is sustainability. I suppose maybe three years ago, the word sustainability, four years ago, maybe the word sustainability came out, and it just has, has grown and increased in popularity. It's in all areas now, but it's a big one for these agri-food businesses, and they have to show to be sustainable now because it's what the consumer wants. Is it um, a, a big challenge for them? It is. Um, it, the positive thing that we got in the report is 90% of businesses are taking climate action. So they're reducing energy usage, they're reducing waste, they're changing packaging. That's all really positive. The other positive thing is 75% have currently set or are in the process of setting sustainability targets. Now that's vital because that gives you a baseline to which you can progress from. The one thing I'd say is there is a raft of legislation coming from Europe at the moment that's going to eventually impact on SMEs. It'll impact the large PLCs first. And forgive all these terms, but these are the terms that are going to become pretty common for business owners over the next couple of years. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, the Green Claims Directive, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, the European Union Decarbonisation Regulation. Now, they're mouthfuls, right? Mm. But they're actually 
that's actually the legislation that is going to eventually trickle down an impact on um, impact on farmers, impact on SMEs, because the large companies will be forced to report across all those um, legislative instruments, and um, they'll eventually make sure that everybody else has to feed into to those reports. So that's a big deal that's happening at the moment, and it is going to be an extra burden of cost on SMEs over time. Uh, yeah, there's no avoiding it really. Um, David, it's, it's, it's where we're at and it's the, the hand we're being dealt at the moment. Uh, finally, just before I let you go, David, look, you're at this, uh, this is the seventh uh, annual report. Is there a model you've seen over the course of the last number of years in, in this sector that, that works well, that's efficient, that maybe grabs a new idea, you know, does X, Y, Z right and gets to grow pretty quickly? Or is it just really, you know, it just depends on the market and depends on, on, on maybe a bit of luck as well? In the, I, I, we'll go over the agri sector first. Like in the agri sector, it definitely takes time. There's very few overnight successes, because ultimately the farmer is the customer for any agri innovation, and it takes time to convince the farmer. Every farmer has tight enough margins, has to make sensible decisions. The business case has to be very clear. So it takes a lot of time. But what we've seen is um, good leadership, good management teams. Um, people putting in the time, putting in the effort, those who are exporting, get on a plane, right? That's probably number one advice. If you're going to go exporting, you have to get on the plane. And we feel that, especially in Ireland where dairy growth has plateaued, if an agri-business or an ag-tech company is going to grow, they have to be focused on export. And that's why we focus this report on internationalization you have to get on the plane you have to put a dedicated person in charge of international growth you have to give it time you have to put in the right tax structure you have to do your international due diligence get the right distributor so um those businesses that we see as being most successful have very good leadership or a very good owner or managing director um and they are thinking about export and accelerating their export journey Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Look, I could talk to you all even, to be honest, with you. There's so much detail in it. It's available online and it's well worth having a flick through. Uh, hopefully I'll speak to you before this time next year, David. But I'll say many thanks for joining me on the programme and giving us a rundown of the report. Thanks very much, MJ. Uh, David Layden there from IFAC. And now we're going to shoot to a break really quickly because I am getting short on time and I have Hannah Quinn Mulligan uh, coming up after the break. She's going to be on TV in about 45 minutes time. She is a columnist with the Farming Independent Farms down in Limerick with her family and we're going to speak to her in just a moment so stay tuned. Country Life on Midlands 103 brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands worshaw.ie and you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. It is the last segment of this evening's programme and we are moving on to things TV related because we have Hannah Quinn Mulligan on the line and she's going to be on TV in about 45 minutes time. Hannah, many thanks for taking my call this evening. Thank you, good. MJ, yeah, on TG Cahar, so I'd better throw in a few couple of fuckles. But uh, yeah, it's pre-recorded, we should tell people I'm not in the studio or anything like that. You're, you're not going to be live for, in 40 minutes. It's uh, Cave Nori Natalone, and it is yeah. a series about yourself and a number of other farmers. Uh, when was it filmed, Hannah, and what's it broadly about? Yeah, so I guess Cave Nori Natalone is uh, basically custodians of the land. Um, which I guess lots of farmers would consider themselves and do a lot of work for nature and for the land. So it was filmed over the length of a year, uh, between 2022 and 2023, uh, and it was basically spring, summer, autumn, winter, all the seasons, and uh, what, 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 what fresh hell and joy that they bring every year. Uh, yeah, well, they got you on a good uh, good year there. It was, um, you know, poor, poor weather, poor spring. So there was obviously lots of uh, content over the course of the year. And I suppose the idea of this being the custodians of the land is showing the farming practices that you were undertaking, which is helping the land and farming in line with nature. So you're an organic farmer. And I suppose that's part of it all, really, just showing that you're, you're, you're a sustainable farmer, um, farming for future. Yeah, well, it features four farmers um, all across 
Ireland. I mean, I'm based down in Limerick, uh, just outside Croom. There's um, someone on the Aran Islands. Uh, there's someone in Kildare. There's someone else. God help me, I can't remember <laughs> where they are. But like the whole point of this, whether you're organic or non-organic, you know, what farmers everywhere are kind of doing to protect nature and support nature. And like, it's a funny thing there. I mean, when you think about the next common agricultural policy or even previous common agricultural policies, you know, what farmers were paid for and what they weren't paid for. I mean, like, on my own farm now, it is just bizarre. Like, we have bits and patches of scrub that we would have left there there for wildlife and we were penalised for them. Like, we lost our farm entitlements. Mm. And they might have been, like, 0.02 of an entitlement, but it all adds up at the end of the day. And now things have completely reversed. And the department is saying that we can claim like about half of that, what they call that scrub area. But I mean, they still won't give us our full entitlements back on Mm. that scrub area that's now supporting nature. So, you know, it's great in some ways. And in other ways, the mindset really has to change. And I guess non-farmers listening might think that farmers do a lot of damage to the environment. And sometimes they do. But there's an awful lot more of us out there who are trying to protect it. So hopefully that's what the show will, will, uh, will give some insight into. Yeah, no, it's a great point about the, uh, the scrub ground, uh, Hannah, I have to say. As a farmer said to me once, he said, if you left a pair of Wellingtons out in the field when the eye in the sky was taking a picture, you'd lose 0. 0.000 whatever it would be of the size of the Wellingtons on the ground. And I, 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 I think it's every hour. Like, I think the satellite <laughs> passes of, uh, passes farms every single yeah. hour. And, like, it's a very blanket type of inspection. You know, it doesn't really pick up what's going on. Like, one thing that was really nice and we show in the show, say, on our, my farm anyway, is that... Um, um, we're in the National Parks and Wildlife Team. There's not very many farmers in it. I think there's only 300 across the country. But they come out and talk to you and say, you know, direct one to one and say, OK, you're doing this well. You're doing not doing that so well. But like, would you like some money to do things or to improve nature? And like we built ponds. Like they gave us money to build ponds. They gave us money to um, cut down conifer trees that weren't that were blocking out the broadleaf trees because obviously broadleaf trees attract more species. Um, they gave us money to build an otter halt to try uh, by the stream to try and get otters back because we saw a survey from the 1990s that there were otters in the stream um, where the farm is uh, at the end of our field. Um, you know, they're really supportive. And, um, you know, the Otter Holt is actually inspired by Jeremy Clarkson for anyone who watches Clarkson's farm. And lots so, of people I mean, do. We're all, we're all standing on the shoulders of someone else, you know, so hopefully it'll have a trickle down effect and someone else might think, oh, I could build a pond or I could do this or that. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be lots on offer, uh, Hannah, on the show. Also, look, you're a busy lady. You're doing a podcast as well, Organic Podcast. You are writing a column with the farming Indo, but also you have a farm yeah. shop and you're selling direct from the farm. <laughs> and we, we always like to uh, support farmers who are selling direct from the farm here on the programme. It's called Tory Hill House, T-O-R-Y, Hill House. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not supporters of Boris Johnson or anything. It's just an old Irish word that happens to be Tory. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I see one of, one of uh, your podcasts is raw milk and uh, there's not too many of you producing raw milk or selling raw lots of people producing it but uh, mostly it goes on to be uh, pasteurised homogenised but you're selling it as a raw milk product Uh, how's that going for you Hannah? It's it's going really well so this is the first year that we have our uh, our licence so there's 17,500 dairy farmers in the country only five of us have a raw milk licence and like it's funny in a way, raw milk kind of puts people off. It, uh, sometimes I think it should be called pure milk. But like basically what it means is it just comes straight from the cow. A lot of people have reared on it. Um, we only milk once a day, so it's creamier. We sell it in nice glass bottles. And, you know, after an hour or two, the cream is there sitting on the top. And at home anyway, I have to stop my grandmother from uh, skimming the cream off mm. the top of all the bottles. But, um, yeah, we sell, uh, oh God, we sell uh, milk. We sell yogurt. We sell uh, kefir. Kefir is getting very popular now. We sell organic beef so we have purebred Hereford herd. So we always had purebred Herefords and you'll see them in the documentary. But um, ever since then, I've started milking at home just with four four British Frisian kind of traditional style cows mm. and uh, Millie, Molly, Nasey and Myrtle, they're called. The Herefords all have names too, but there's 20 of them and we don't have time to get through that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, I just, I always wanted to make a living out of the farm. You know, I didn't really want it to be a hobby farm. And I thought if the rains are getting handed to me on the farm, it's my grandmother's farm originally. I just thought, look, I want to make go of making a living out of it and see what happens and if it doesn't work out 
Um, it, won't, it doesn't work out, but I, I'd regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't try. Um, so that's that's what this is. This year, this year's trying, and so far, so good. Yeah, absolutely. And sure, if it doesn't, you know, if you know, just always you can go back and do something else. Uh, but as you say, you won't have any regrets, and I'm sure it will, given your passion and, and enthusiasm for it. Hannah, we're going to say many thanks. The show is on in uh, just over thirty minutes' time. TG Catter, and uh, we'll speak to you again on the program here. Many thanks, Hannah. Thanks, so Gamil Magad. Uh, Hannah Quinn Mulligan and that is on TG Cahar at uh, 8.30 this evening it's called Quave Nori Natalun and as we said it charts uh, about uh, five or six farmers around the country for the course of a borderline a year actually I didn't think it was that long but uh, you will also see Hannah's articles weekly in the Farming Indo and I have to say they're always very enjoyable a bit of humour involved in them as well which is what we want because things are very serious in the agri-sphere sometimes and uh, we need a little bit of light-hearted relief that is it for this evening's programme I would like to thank all of my guests who joined me this evening Pat Carroll from Clonus Lee Show taking place this Sunday fingers crossed for the weather working very hard over there in County Leash so hopefully things go well for them on a Sunday Darren Arkins from the HSA talking about working at height David Laden from IFAC with some really interesting info there on the food and agribusiness sector and Hannah Quinn Mulligan joined me just there from County Limerick Tory Hill House is the name of her website if you're looking to pick up any of the produce direct from the farm show is repeated on Sunday morning at 7am through to 8am I'll be back with you in seven days time as always and we will speak to you then if you want to get our podcast type in MJ space Cleary C-L-E-R-Y will pop up wherever you get your podcast good night and God bless